Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that was fun. This one's been interesting. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, thanks for sticking around. This is uh, really cool to see how many people stay around to the end. Um, so thank you all for being here. Uh, so while we were waiting, I was able to do the count that I normally can't do till later. Um, so this year we had 542 people through the door, which is a Pi Ohio record. Um, I want to reiterate that we have t-shirts available for a $40 or more donation at the tables out there. Um, you know you want one or two or three or Five. I am absolutely super excited uh, to be able to announce your Pi Ohio chair for 2020 and 2021. Um, this was his 10th Pi Ohio and his eighth as the volunteer coordinator, um, and yet he still has no idea the fun he is in for. <laughs> Jason Green. Um, and finally, I just want to thank a lot of folks, the sponsors who helped us make this conference free to attend, um, and everybody who did individual donations. Um, that helped us uh, put us over into the black this year. Like That was the difference in us uh, having a dip in their reserves versus having a little money that we can do something more with next year. Um, I want to thank all the volunteers that made this happen because um, they're the ones that were running around and finding batteries and seeing where the AV folks are and uh, all that stuff. Um, and we figured it out. So thank you to every volunteer uh, that helped us do that. Uh, thanks for the organizing committee uh, that worked pretty much since a month after the con uh, conference last year, getting this thing going. Um, so much went into it and uh, it was really cool to see it all come together here. Um, and again, I said this in the mornings, but in case you weren't here, we are looking to expand that group. Um, we'd love to kind of spread around the work and uh, get some new thoughts and uh, some new folks involved. So if you are interested in that, uh, send an email to info at pyohio.org and we will put you on the list. We're going to take a little break and then we'll reach out to you in probably about a month. Um, I want to thank Carl and his team of video folks. Um, who've done a great job dealing with a lot of uh, interesting situations this weekend, and uh, I think we made everything work. So uh, that was really cool. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the speakers who poured hours of work into preparing talks and tutorials and keynotes uh, for all of you to enjoy and get something out of. Um, they did, like, hours wise all the work of this conference and it uh, it's really cool to see that kind of content come together and now we can share it with the world. Um, so I seriously love this community and I have been so honored to be able to do this for you all um, and I am super relieved to be almost done. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for making this Pi Ohio uh, what it was and uh, I hope you come back next year. So that is the end of the main part of the conference. We're going to do some lightning talks, and then we're going to get out of the building. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Okay, that, no, stop. Okay, close enough. I've never touched a computer before in my life. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> You're not the only one. Yeah. Um, so for the first lightning talk, we have Kat Passen with Accessible Live Tweeting. Okay, so I'm Kat. I do a lot of the front end work for Pi Ohio. I also do the accessibility work for Pi Ohio. I don't know how to stop talking about web accessibility, so I'm here to lightning talk about it. 
So why why are we why are we talking about this? Um, people like to share things in tweets, and you should make it easy for people to follow along in your tweets. And sometimes that's kind of hard because Twitter is bad. And I'm not just talking about the new Twitter that everyone seems to hate. I'm talking about the if you don't know or if you have like an assistive technology that you're using, Twitter is really really hard to use actually. So what can you do to make things better? Um, as a speaker. You can add your Twitter handle to all of your slides, and I mean all of your slides, not just the intro slide or the end slide, because people like to tweet in the middle and want to reference, hey, this is the person who's talking about the thing. And you should position that based on like the content of your slide and what the projection's doing. So for example, mine is in the top corner because I know, based on having seen some of the videos or pictures, that if I put it in the bottom, it might get covered by where I'm standing at the podium. You should also use good fonts and colors on your slides to provide contrast and readability. And this includes your code samples, because we all see pictures of people having done a sample, and then you can't see it in the color scheme because it was dark colors on black background or something. And you should also post your slides online and maybe pin that tweet to your profile. So that way, people can reference them easily, because people will go and say, oh, I have this thing, and there's a link in my slides. And then people will be like, I'm going to dig that out and tweet about it. As an example from the PyOhio hashtag from yesterday, I believe, maybe it was today, I can't, I can't read anymore. Um, here's an example of posting your slides and your resources from your talk. So as an attendee, you should camel case your hashtags. And this one is actually important because screen readers will actually be able to read the words better if you leave it all lowercase, much like your actual Twitter handle. Sometimes they don't know what to do with that and the pronunciation gets all screwed up. Uh, tag the speaker if they have an account so that people can go look at their profile and get to, I don't know, their website or other things that they have. Add some good alt text for your pictures because if people can't see the images, then they won't necessarily know what you're talking about. And tweet descriptive things that maybe are good. Uh, that's, that's not necessarily a hard and fast rule. But here's an example of somebody who was attending the Lightning Talks last night tweeting about, hey, here's some resources from the Lightning Talks, and that's great. Here's an example of doing image descriptions. Uh, the bullet points on this were very, very long, and fitting them all into one tweet was kind of a pain. So I rattled off all of the image content, and people were like, hey, this was really helpful. That's great. Thanks for doing that. This doesn't mean that you can't do just tweets like this, because sometimes the... I, I don't even know where to begin with APL. This talk was wild. But... <laughs> Like, if you're going to do something like this, at least like maybe provide a follow-up tweet as context to be like, hey, this, this was what was going on, so that you have a little bit more context for people who might not be able to deal with Twitter's interface. So thanks. Try tweeting. <laughs> Spare everyone from slides. I'll do the presentation. <laughs> Excellent. I am the PowerPoint. Um, next up is Shelby uh, talking about Pygmalion. <laughs> testing, testing, testing. Okay. So I have a degree in neuroscience. And it is my favorite and most expensive conversation starter. <laughs> and so a lot of people are like, how in the heck did you get from that to here? And then I see this process all over again that I've watched happen over and over from the time that I became aware of myself as a homo sapien, which is people constantly trying to whether they do it because they're well-intended, mal-intended, don't even know what they're doing, kind of reinforcing this idea of, I see this thing, I expect this thing, so I'm going to steer it towards this thing. So the way I got into IT was ironically through my neuroscience major. I took a computational neuroscience class, and that exposed me to the sheer like playground that just was technology. And honestly, I tell people like, if you don't want to get a computer science major, 
and you don't want to get a physics major, but you want to go into computers, get a neuroscience major. It's like third best. There's so much technology. It becomes more and more a computer science degree anyway, honestly. But as I was switching, but you know, the other thing too of how I switched to IT is because at the time it was like, well, there's lab jobs and you can work a $14 a lab job for like years and then maybe you'll be like an associate scientist and then a lead scientist if you're lucky before you're 40. That's a whole other talk for a whole other conference. Um, <laughs> so it became, do I take this job that I'm okay with, that will pay okay, or work a little bit for these jobs that I would love that would pay really great? Hmm. So, I kind of just kept self-training, and I find within the IT community, we have an interesting relationship with self-trainers. We angelicize them, but they're also kind of weirdly villainized when you're getting into environments that mix the old and the new. I've had people simultaneously praise me and also kind of be like, yeah, maybe you should go back to your original field when I tell them what I'm switching to. And mind you too, it's not just like I'm switching from neuroscience, like biology, to like computational neuroscience. It's like, no, I'm in cloud now. I'm trying to get my AWS certification. <laughs> <laughs> and on the flip side, you have people who do have formal education and they've done all this great technology and they're constantly told how great they are. And this is where the actual title is going to come in again. I see a lot of Pagmillion effect within the IT community, or at least what people, that's what people think they're seeing. But I think in some ways it's actually the inverse because we keep telling the same few over and over again, you know, the Steve Jobs, Bill Gates type, how great they are. And it's like, okay, you tell them how great they are, they're continue to output great stuff. And I think that weirdly discourages a lot of people because when you actually first enter, everything you do sucks. <laughs> everything. And so in the interest of one minute, because I really could whine for 20 minutes. <laughs> so let's move on to the buzzword of being solution driven, which is to get out of the Pagmillion effect, to get out of that game, don't play it to begin with. You win the game by not playing. You have to be your own Pagmillion effect and just, I learned because I just did it. I found coding therapeutic. And so I was like, even if I suck at it and can only get like 40,000 low end job, I'll ultimately be more at peace with myself. And I'm good. Uh, so next up, BYO API, uh, Selenium to the Rescue by Nick Cantor. Hi. No, 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 hold on. This is, this is about to be terrible. Um, we're about to do the thing everybody, every conference has at least one talk. I think like, here's something cool, please don't do this. Uh, this is something cool, please don't do this. Um, I work at a company that deals with a lot of external vendors, and I work on the data team, but I'm not a data person, I'm a software person. And I'm the only person there who's done software for a long time, so when no one has any idea how to deal with a piece of technology, they come to me. Um, so when there's no API for a service we're using and we need to get the data off somehow, they come to me. We need to put the data in there, and there's no API, they also come to me. Um, so this started as a uh, POS system interaction with kind of our software 
BIOS systems power the restaurants at Sweet Green, which is where I work. Um, we need to get some numbers into the system. Uh, that company has not yet heard of the word API or that acronym. Um, so the best they have is a desktop client with an inappropriate name, which watches a folder on your desktop or in your machine and like upload automatically files. So the first thing we did was we tried to build an ETL that built the file for that, shove it in there, and then it wiped out a bunch of other data because they had a bug, because no one ever tried this before. <laughs> so then we decided that uh, we're gonna use Selenium to build our own API, because why wouldn't you do this, right? It, it works, right? Um, yeah, so we're gonna build an API here together a little bit. Um, wh why wouldn't we? It's fine. We won't do anything harmful. Uh, we are gonna use the PyOhio website, which you're all familiar with. Um, this is particularly the talks page, and you can see the little cards for the talks. Um, and I feel like there should be a web, an API for this because I'm a, I'm a developer. And so we're going to build a very small one using a little bit of Selenium and a little bit of Flask. Um, hopefully that is legible. Um, this is Caltema project, uses Flask and Selenium. There's a little helper here to initialize the Chrome driver. And for those of you who don't know, Selenium will literally run a web browser and pretend it's a person clicking around and doing whatever. So you can probably imagine why this is a really bad idea. Um, we have two endpoints we're going to try to tackle. We'll see how much we actually get through. We're going to try to get a list of talks, and we're trying to get the ability to actually get a single talk. Um, and so the easiest way to do this is to assume that no one will ever change the DOM in front of you, um, and because people don't do that kind of stuff, right? Um, so if you inspect it, you can take a look at what you have there. And I did this a little earlier today. And if you look through it, you'll notice that these cards have a few different classes. And through some trial and error, I discovered that the scheduled talk is the one we actually want. And if you look in there, let's say that we care about the title, which is going to be scheduled title. And let's say, since we need to get an individual talk, we need to get this ID here somehow. Um, so when I try to essentially grab these the way you would with a scraper, um, but not with a scraper because we're cooler than that. Um, so we're going to start with the URL. And we're going to, uh, let's do this. So we're going to get a driver from our init driver helper up there, which essentially just gives us a, uh, a Chrome instance, essentially. Um, we're going to send that driver to the page that I just copy pasted. Um, this now means the driver's on that page, and we could do stuff. Now we have the DOM. And so let's say we want to grab all of those. So we'll look at find element by class name. And I know way too much of Selenium's API at this point. Um, <laughs> we're going to use just the schedule talk class. Uh, this is the one time where I highly advocate copy pasting class names from the wherever you're looking at, because you will get them wrong, and then it gets really annoying. So let's say these are all the cards. Um, and then, well, let's see what we can get if we just return them. Uh, so let's say that these are the talks, and we're just going to shove in the cards. I have a web server running in the background. Presumably, this should be OK. Uh, talks. So now it's literally firing up a second browser you can't see, and there's an error. Nice. Right, because it's not serializable, of course. Uh, since I'm taking a lot longer than I thought, I'm going to cheat a little bit. And essentially, we're going to try to get URLs by doing this. Um, get attribute. And we know, uh, or, sorry, that actually find element by class name. And it was, I think, uh, schedule title. Yeah, schedule title. Uh, get its attribute, uh, or and it's going to be inner HTML for card in, and we'll hopefully, yeah, black formats it a little better than that. Uh, this should now get us just a list of URLs. If I didn't mess that up as well, nope, still not happening. Not the greatest demo I've done. Anyway, I promise that it works. How's that? <laughs> because we're running it in production. So since he wasn't able to get that done, I do have good news. We do actually have an API for all of the scheduled data. Um, <laughs> so you could have just used that.
All right, cool. Yeah, so next up, we're going to hear about Busy Beaver. All right, hey, everybody. My name is Ali Sivji. I'm one of the organizers of the Chicago Python News Group. And I'm here to talk to you about a community outreach initiative we've been working on for the past few months called Busy Beaver. I'm going to lightning talk, talk really fast. <laughs> So we're fortunate to have a great community of Pythonistas in the Windy City. And at the heart of this community is the Chicago Python Users Group, or CHIPI. We have almost 5,000 members. Since our inception uh, 15, uh, 16 years ago, we've uh, had around 175 monthly meetings. And now we have around four to seven events a month. It's pretty awesome. So in addition to our general monthly meeting, which we call the Dunder Main Meeting, we have special interest groups. We have the data SIG, we have web dev slash DevOps SIG, finance SIG. We recently started doing some more open source work with chippy.org and Busy Beaver. We also did a Pandas documentation sprint. Uh, we also have an event at lunch for those folks who can't make it to our evening meetups. And we've also recently started one for uh, coding interviews and whiteboarding to help folks get their first programming job. We also have a monthly project night. So that has two tracks. We have a challenge project and a bring your own project. We also have a world famous mentorship program. And this is a 13 week one on one project based mentorship. We have two cohorts a year with 20 to 30 mentor mentor, a mentor mentee pairings uh, each cohort. And at the end, the top 10 mentees based on blog post attendance uh, get to give a, a lightning talk at a chippy uh, event. The next one, uh, our next session is starting in uh, a couple months or in a month. So it should be a lot of fun. So like most organizations, Slack is our primary means of communication in between our events. The chat platform has become ingrained in our community. It's become part of our communication strategy as organizers. We have many different channels focused on many different conversations. My favorites include Book Club, Advent of Code, and Pets of Chippy is also a lot of fun. So Slack has a lot of plugins, and we use Izzy's integrations quite extensively. But these plugins are great. They make our life easy. But as organizers of a tech-focused community, we have a different set of problems. We're trying to build a community. We're trying to foster conversations around Python to keep people coming back and participating. Our Slack, it's really only as good as the conversations we have on it. So nothing out there fit our custom use case, so we created our own solution. So we put together a team and let them loose on a problem. After a lot of work and just a little bit of design, the end result is Busy Beaver. <laughs> And so the Busy Beaver is a Slack bot built specifically for the Chicago Python workspace. The bot's mission is to increase engagement within the Chicago Python community. So this is a really broad scope. What does it mean? So GitHub seems like a good place to start. It's a social coding platform. Lots of developers use GitHub to, uh, to store their code and, and to interact with other developers. A majority of our members have GitHub accounts, but as an organization, we didn't have a lot of insights into projects people are working on, into open source uh, projects they're contributing to, into repositories they're starting. So increasing awareness about side projects seemed like a really good place to start to increase engagement. So the first feature we built was to uh, post daily summaries of public GitHub activity for registered users in the, uh, Slack, in the Busy Beaver channel. People love this feature, and by people, I really mean me. So we decided to add like another feature. Over the past few months, the at Chicago Python Twitter feed has become a lot more active. We're sharing a lot of information about what's going on within the Chicago community, as well as the wider Python ecosystem as a whole. But not all of our people, not all of our members that are on Slack follow us on Twitter. So we created another feature. This feature just retweets what we uh, post on Twitter in a Slack chat room. So it's pretty good. It increases the, uh, the reach over social media platform. We also sprinted on Busy Beaver at PyCon, and I ha we had a contributor from, I um, can't really remember where he was from, he was an organizer. They had a feature in their Slack that uh, displayed upcoming events, so we added a slash command. So now when you do slash Busy Beaver events, it goes to our database and pulls our next five events. So what's the Busy Beaver roadmap? So over the past few months, I've been working on enabling other workspaces to install this. Uh, right now, it is beta. We only have a couple of features enabled. Uh, so reach out if you'd like to uh, have, this, um, have this integration installed in your personal Slack or your uh, team Slack. It's an open source project. We're released under the MIT license. There's a lot of documentation to help you get started. We have a project board with a pretty active uh, issues uh, board as well. Things are marked as good first, uh, good first issue, uh, how hard they are in terms of effort and uh, how long they, I think they're going to take. There's also a fully built out CI CD pipeline. So if you do have a PR, write some tests, we can get it shipped into production really quickly. Uh, so you can start contributing, checking, it, checking us out on GitHub. Uh, look over to the README, join the Chippy Slack. We're always having discussions on Busy Beaver Meta. I also have swag. So if you want some stickers, let me know. There are buttons for contributors. 
Thanks so much, everybody. And before I go, I just want to acknowledge all my other Chicago Python organizers. Without them, we couldn't build such a vibrant community. Thank you. So for the last lightning talk of Pi Ohio 2019, we have Dustin Ingram with uh, Ministry of Silly Runtimes. No pressure. <laughs> uh, hey, 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 everyone. If you thought Nick's talk was a bad idea, this is gonna be so much better. All right, so, uh, so hey, I'm Dustin. I work at Google Cloud. My job is uh, Python developer advocacy. So at Google Cloud, it's kind of like this Venn diagram. It's actually kind of like this because a lot of things have Python runtimes. I want to talk to you about a specific product that doesn't have a Python runtime, but I'm really excited about it. It's called Cloud Run, uh, AKA it's Docker images as a service. So basically you can define a Docker image and you can deploy it. And if it uh, opens up on an HTTP container, it works. So basically the contract is this, your container image can run code written in the programming language of your choice and any base image uh, provided that respects the basic uh, constraints listed. So the constraints are, it has to listen for requests on a specific port, and it has to start an HTTP server in four minutes, which is plenty of time to start an HTTP server. Uh, so an example, you could write a little Flask app that looks like this. This is just hello world in Flask. Uh, simple requirements.txt file. You write a Docker file that looks like this. Install your requirements, run Python app.py, and it'll, it'll work. It'll be up on, on whatever port you want. Okay, so that uses the uh, Python official Docker images, by the way. It doesn't just come from some runtime that we define. It has a free tier, it's really fun. Uh, so if you listened to my talk earlier, I was talking about like making useless and fun things. Uh, so when I saw this, that you could define any programming language of your choice and any base image, I was like, really, any programming language? <laughs> any base image. Uh, so what I did was I went to python.org and I clicked downloads. And I went to looking for specific release. And I went to view older releases. <laughs> older source releases. I landed on this page, which is at legacy.python.org, uh, which is served by an Apache 2 server running on port 443 for some reason. I don't know. Uh, so I scrolled down all the way to the bottom, and I found Python 1.0.1, which is updated on 2002. Uh, I wrote a little patch to get this to run. Amazingly, it runs on the latest version of Ubuntu. And so then I wrote a Docker file, and Docker file basically uh, downloads, uh, takes Ubuntu, gets some dependencies, downloads that source release, installs my patch, and then runs Python. And so then I get a Docker image, and I get root, root hacked. <laughs> uh, I run Python double dash version, but that doesn't exist yet in Python 1.0. <laughs> But you can still run a Python REPL. So Python REPL, this is Python 1.0.1, copyright 1991, and that was the university that Guido went to. Uh, so the only problem with this is Python 1.0.1 doesn't have an HTTP server in it. So back to the drawing board, back to legacy.python.org. I went to Python 1.3, which was uploaded in 2001, which is earlier than 2002. For, I don't understand that. <laughs> I wrote another patch. It still compiles on the latest version of Ubuntu. Another Docker file, and I get root again. Still no double dash version. However, we get a REPL, and lo and behold, from base HTTP server, import HTTP server, we have an HTTP server. So we can write something like this. And if you squint at this, it kind of looks like that Flask app I showed before. Uh, it's a little different. You know, what it does is it says hello from Python, prints the version there, uh, a little thing to run it. You know, that looks kind of familiar. So then I defined some Docker images to inherit from. <laughs> and I actually went and did all of them from 1.0.1 to 1.3, just for fun. And so then I can write a Docker file that looks like this from my Docker file. Set up some other stuff, copy the code in. From this port, run Python app.py. Uh, so then I get this, these two files, Docker file, app.py. That's it. 
I run this G cloud build submit. This builds the Docker image, does the building, 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 success. <laughs> then I run uh, cloud run deploy, whatever. So cloud run deploy, I give it the tag to my, where my Docker image was built. It runs it, it gives me a URL that's live. I can just go and click and see it work. And I get hello from Python 1.3. <laughs> <laughs> We did it. All right, so if you want to read more, you can go to cloud.google.com to learn about the product. If you don't want to learn about the product, you can learn about vintage Python. And if you want to run it yourself, you, all you have to do is run this command and you get a Python REPL in Python 1.3. So thanks, everybody. So thank you all the lightning talk speakers. Um, so this is it, the end of Pi Ohio 2019. It's not goodbye. But good news, <laughs> we'll be planning Pi Ohio 2020 very soon. Um, so we hope to see you all back next year. Um, in the meantime, please do remember to rate the talks and tutorials that you've attended this weekend. We're gonna provide that feedback directly to the speakers so they uh, know what they can do better next time. So, um, and with that, I think we're done. So everybody, get out. <laughs>